Thank you everyone for joining us for this webinar. Um, sorry, I just lost my screen. <laughs> Thank you everyone for joining this webinar with Craig Rutherford. My name is Laura Lawrence and I'm the Global Marketing Director at Harman. So just a few things before we get started. Everyone on the call is muted to keep down noise levels during the webinar. However, there is a Q&A function where you can submit questions to the presenter and they'll try to answer as many questions as possible. This webinar is also being recorded and the link will be made available a few days after this presentation. We do have a number of other webinars taking place over the next few months for audio, lighting, video and control and we'd like to encourage you to take a look at the different webinars in our learning session workshop series on pro.harman.com. We're adding new sessions daily and have over 20 sessions scheduled for August and September, so watch for those on the calendar. And just a fun fact for you today, um, this is officially our 100th session, so congratulations, Craig, for um, being the one to hit that number. Um, and Craig has been with us a couple of times, so we really appreciate your support of our learning sessions. Um, as a fun activity today to celebrate it being the 100th session, I am going to randomly pick a handful of winners for some Martin swag. So um, make sure you stay on the call for that, and I will be reaching out to you for your mailing address. Um, and now I'd like to introduce you to Craig Rutherford, the presenter for today's webinar. Craig is a lighting designer based in Minneapolis, where he lives with his partner and their five children. Having had an interest in production since childhood, he's worked as a technical director, a touring lighting director, and a full-fledged production and lighting designer. Now I'll pass it over to you, Craig. Well, buenos dias, trocnanama, or guten abend, whatever works for where you are. Uh, today is Thursday, August 20th, and my name is Craig Rutherford. Uh, first in my heart is to say thank you to all of you who are attending again. I am right here with you uh, in isolation, trying new hairstyles and doing housework, going through the daily grind, and I can understand, uh, or at least I can imagine, the difficulties you are all experiencing. Um, if I may be allowed the privilege of sort of brief public service announcement, it would be this. Please continue to take care of yourselves. Take breaks, keep a daily schedule, eat good food, and try not to succumb to despair. Let us all continue to stand together, striving to practice empathy in this disharmonious moment. Whether your hours have been merely cut, or like me, you really haven't had a lot of work since February. Seeing the camaraderie in this industry over the past few months has been inspiring and it is a privilege again to be here with you and I am humbled that you have taken the time to join with me here today. Uh, I understand that this is the 100th Martin webinar so we're all gathered here on a nice round number which is an exciting milestone and I am grateful to Martin Professional and Harmon for bringing us all together in this way. So in my last webinar, we deeply explored the topic of color theory. What I want to do in this presentation is pull back the proverbial camera lens and broaden the topic to the fundamentals of all areas of lighting design for concerts and talk in depth about what makes an effective lighting design for a performance and how to use the tools at our disposal to create something truly memorable for our audience. And as last time, I personally think in terms of songs at a concert because that's a lot of what I do. So when I refer to songs, understand that the term can stand in for any chunk of time into which you could substitute scene or act or performance and still arrive at the same general understanding. Also, there are going to be things in here that are more my opinion of the art and not really hard established science. So with those things in mind, let us begin. Our topic today, I have titled Conceptual Design Principles, the Fundamentals of Lighting Design for Concerts. And the first fundamental concept that we shall acknowledge here is that we as lighting designers deal in just one currency and that is looks. A look is a slice of time, however short or long, where our stage has a particular visual appearance. And this could be a song, a part of a song, the stage for an entire talking head style presentation, or really anything that can be differentiated from what is before or after it. What differentiates one look from another could be a color or a gobo, a video clip, the focus position of the lights, or even a particular sequence of flashes or dimmer chases. It could be a minute, an 
hour or a moment. Years ago, I went to see a show at the Nashville Arena. Now, I'm not sure what corporate investment group has the naming rights these days, but people who are from Nashville know the building I'm talking about. This was a big rock show, and the designer had a truly spectacular rig of lights. TMB flares and pixel mappable uh, LED washes, Sharpies, and they had them in numbers. And the lighting was noticeably bad. There were a few movement effects. There were some can-cans. There was a circle valley where all of the lights went in the same direction uh, in what looked like a, a canned circle effect that had an offset uniformly applied to it without either randomization to break up the effect at all or any symmetry applied that made sense. And those effects kept getting reused. The flares were all up in my face, burning my retinas way too often. The Sharpies made cool Sharpie beams, but that was all they did. And they had LED wash lights, a model which I know had pixel mapping or at least some internal animations. And these abilities were ignored for just big beams of wash looks throughout the night. Now, did the music call for bombastic, uh, even uh, would I say basic lighting at times? It did. It was a big rock show, and it needed to be programmed with some of these big, chunky, basic looks. But the lighting lacked taste, a sense of cohesion, and the designer failed to make use of all the things that the light could do, which I felt ultimately left the lighting feeling bland and unimaginative. Between ostentatious flash and trash and ascetic starkness, there is a good taste that a good design will occupy. And within this art lies the concept of making the lights not flashy, not overbearing, but visually attractive and interesting in a sense that is complementary to the music or to the mood. Now, I tell this story to illustrate the fact that having a giant rig of the newest cool lights does not mean that your show is going to have good looks. Now, it can be perhaps a different challenge to make a small rig look the way you want it to, but merely having tons of lights at your disposal will not produce results without the skill of the programmer. Lighting is art, it is looks, and just turning on lights and fiddling with the dials will likely not produce a memorable experience. Art, in this case looks, require intentionality. So the ultimate goal of any lighting design is to light the space that the performance takes place in and to light the people or objects, hello car show people, doing the performing. And along the way, hopefully we can bring to bear some visual interest as well. So let's explore some fundamental concepts to keep in mind as part of our creative toolkit. A basic lighting design consists of <clears throat> light sources and space generally with some human interaction in the form of an actor, a performer, or some objects, usually for concerts or lighting humans. Further, lighting design is a visual experience within both space and time, and this is important to remember. At this most basic level of lighting design, understand these properties of light. Light directs attention. The brightest part of a scene is generally the part that people are going to look at first. Secondly, light reveals form and shape, and conversely, its lack can conceal them. And finally, light helps the audience understand the emotional content of the scene. So to begin to paint our visual picture, we have to understand the tools that we have at our disposal. There are many different ways of categorizing lighting, but I'm gonna go with theme shape, uh, because I think it's the most salient for the purposes of our discussion. Generally speaking, we have four different types of lights that we can consider with two sort of main types. And the first is hard-edged. So these are lights where there's an ability to focus the edges of the light into a sharp edge. And usually, we use the light's ability to have variable focus to do things like have shutters and gobos and animation wheels to change the shape of the light when projected onto scenery or to change how the beams look in the air when we have haze or smoke. A special case, uh, many times the profile lights that we use for lighting talent are hard edge. So like ETC Source 4s, uh, Mac Viper performances, those sorts of things. Next up is wash lights. These tend to have much different optical characteristics than hard edge lights. As you might expect, 
and typically utilize a Fresnel or a softer lens system that blends the edges of the beam, but also blurs the shadows that result from an object blocking the beam. And then there are some more specialized lights. There are beam lights. These are a special type of light that really started with some clay packy products several years ago, and they're useful in projecting a tight beam of concentrated light over a long range. Some of them have gobos or patterns or prisms, but generally they're most useful for shooting massively bright laser-like beams across arenas. They're also generally bright enough to be seen without haze, which is why you'll often see many of them on outdoor shows where filling a large area excuse me, with haze is impractical or difficult. The Super Bowl is a really good example of that. And then there are oddball lights. These don't really fit into any other category. They don't necessarily share any of the optical characteristics because they tend to be well, specialized. Uh, Svobodas, Linenbach lanterns, which can be used to great effect in your designs, but which are not commonly seen. So how do we begin to use these tools to light the performance and the space? Well, together with instrument selection, the first thing that must be decided upon before beginning to create an effective design is your layout. Quick note on terminology here. Uh, lighting design refers to both the design of the overall layout of the lights within the space and the lighting design for individual songs. Uh, but for this latter use, I'll, I'll try to remember to say programming to help differentiate it from the other type of design. So here at the outset is a good place to discuss one of the staples of lighting design layout, the three-point lighting scheme. So this is where we have two lights from the front, and you can see on the screen here an example of this. And with the two front lights being situated at around 45 degree angles to the subject to be lit, with the back lights providing, well, back light. So studying this basic arrangement can help teach us a lot about the fundamentals of lighting, especially when, many times, we're lighting humans. So human bodies, unlike spherical cows, have a lot of little bumps and valleys in them. And so lighting them with a single light from the front makes the features of, say, a human face look flat and uninteresting. Perhaps, somewhat counterintuitively, it is shadows, the absence of light, that most reveal the contours and curves of the human form. So the simple arrangement of two lights from the front helps to give adequate light to our subject while still providing for the possibility of shadow to help reveal shape and form. And the rear light helps to do a few things, as you can see here. Most importantly, light falling on a subject from the rear helps to light the shoulders and define the shape of the head, pulling the subject out of the background, and the face being probably the most important thing that we're going to be closely watching, and the rest of the body as well. However, while a good three-point lighting design does provide dimensionality to the object being lit, it doesn't cover all scenarios. And in moving lighting around to other angles, we can begin to communicate something new about mood and setting. So to illustrate what I mean, let's consider some other lighting angles and how changing them around changes the mood of the scene. So we'll start with directly above. Having a strong light perpendicular to the plane of the floor can achieve a look that is hard and harsh and can read as mysterious or sinister. Fun fact, I'm a left-hander and the word sinister is derived from the Latin word for left-handedness. Thank you, Caesar. Anyway, strong downlight places the features into extreme contrast, if you can even see them at all. And by simply tilting the head forward a touch, the performer can shroud their face in darkness but still have a strong halo effect on their hair and shoulders. Think of a trope scene from the world of a film noir, the mysterious stranger face half hidden in the yellow glare of a sickly street lamp which shines straight down on them from above, waiting in the foggy darkness for their contact from the world of espionage. You can imply a lot with just a single light source and a color. And then there's low backlighting. Silhouetting performers takes away their identity as specific people and turns them into just shadows. But in this masking of feature, the audience is forced to focus on their movements, the cadence of their dancing, the subtle nods and gestures that they make. We see them in a new light in the very absence of light. Using a strong backlight doesn't just mean lighting for straight silhouettes, however. In the absence of a lit backdrop, we could backlight a performer with some haze and the 
performer now engages with the resultant beams in a more interactive way. Their body controls dramatic shafts of light as they spread outward from the point of origin. And then, of course, there's high backlighting. We can use high backlighting on its own to create dramatic washes and some silhouettes, but combined with other sources, it adds tint and shade to a scene without changing the colors of an actor's face, which is often desirable. Up in the air is an obvious place that we put most of our lighting because it's a really versatile place to have lighting. We can point it down or across the stage to the side or straight out at the audience. And then there's side light, which we often see in dance. Side light is particularly effective at revealing physical form. And as with all of these lighting positions, height off the vertical plane will change the look. Low side light, as you might expect, comes from sources that are quite low to the floor, and it allows performers to be lit from head to toe without any spill and can keep shadows off the floor, and that can create a really dramatic presence. Coincidentally, it also creates really tall shadows off to the sides, which can enhance a production if that's the look you're going for. Shifting side lights higher up can create a more natural look that can strongly suggest late afternoon, early morning sunlight. And again, moving these can completely change the mood of a scene. And there's lighting from below. This is a not often seen direction of lighting, at least on its own. Many productions use shin lights or relatively low intensity up lighting to help fill in shadows on a performer's face. Think of those classic shell shaped footlights on old timey Broadway sto shows or stages. But on its own, strong up light can be incredibly dramatic. Part of the reason for this is that we almost never see faces lit from below. Up lighting in our day to day lives is a rare occurrence. A strong uplight gives faces an eerie, otherworldly appearance that suggests horror and instability and dread. A perfect example of this in the world of film can be seen in Kubrick's The Shining. During the scenes with the spectral barkeeper Lloyd at the illusory bar in the Overlook Hotel. So here, Roy Walker's set design has lighting running through the bar itself that Jack and Lloyd converse at, uplighting Nicholson's face. And even though the lighting is soft, giving the audience a sense of unease. This tendency for strong uplight to make faces and indeed other objects look unnatural can be exploited to great effect in concerts and live events by forcing the audience to question what they're seeing for a moment, casting the familiar in unfamiliar light. So therefore, we see that direction is important, but there are other aspects of a given lighting design to consider as well. One of these is evenness. And here, evenness refers to having relatively balanced amounts of each type of lighting available, though not necessarily used or on all the time across the entire set. So you want to be able to have all parts of the set and the performance space lit such that the dynamic range works for both cameras and eyeballs, both of which are a huge part of today's concert experience. That said, Part of the art of contrast is drawing sharp distinctions between lit and unlit, dark and light, and emphasizing spatial relationships with the tools of contrast. So when you hear me say evenness, what, know that what I'm arguing for isn't the six o'clock news look, but an awareness of dynamic range and of the specific use that each light is designed for and the specific look that it gives. One obvious way that we can achieve this requirement is by having a mix of lighting instruments and distributing all of our types in ways that make sense around the performance space, taking note of any gaps that remain, and then working to place lighting in that area that helps to fill in whatever is lacking. For instance, uh, consider a simple stage design wherein you have a row of hard edge fixtures across an upstage truss. This will only give you one look of light from behind one angle. To help fill this in, you could add some moving or even static wash lights to help paint the stage with some color. Even better, you can start to move them around, placing some wash lights on the same truss and then maybe others off to the side to help mix different angles into the mix. Having a variety of lighting positions can, that can all fulfill the two basic lighting functions, hard and wash, will help keep a lighting design rounded. This isn't to say that every position needs to have a mix of all lights to be effective. Remember that particularly within a concert context, we will hopefully have haze to paint with our light on, 
and illuminated beams in haze can help to fill in spots that might otherwise be dark on the stage as well. Having bursts of lights around the set that fill only one niche, like beams, can be really visually effective as well. The point here is not to strive for an even blanket of lights across the visual canvas necessarily, but to be able to fill in lighting where needed and to have the ability to evenly cover the performance space or the, the surface, if you will, in light. In other words, we want to avoid having a situation where a performer can unintentionally get themselves out of the light. We want to make sure that all possible performance space can potentially be covered. Beyond that, we want to strive to make sure that a certain balance is reached between light and dark areas. It's no good to have large, visually obvious dark spaces upstage that never receive any light at all under visual black holes, so to speak, uh, unless it's an intentional choice for the purposes of an effect. The concept of evenness, then, covers the, uh, the idea of lighting the entire set, but not all of the time and not always in the same way. Using a combination of hard edge, washes, and critically accent lighting, you can make sure that every angle of a visual design can have light. On the topic of evenness, a word about coverage. Adequate coverage on all areas of the stage that your talent is likely to travel to is one of the most important aspects of creating a good lighting design, and it can be one of the hardest to implement. As anyone who's worked on a concert knows, Artists have a toddler-like sense for knowing where it is they shouldn't go and then going there. If there's a dark spot in your coverage or a side fill they can hide behind to get away from a follow spot, you can bet your bottom dollar they will go there. So a good lighting designer will bear this tendency in mind and do their best to ensure that all possible areas are covered. And when you cannot, have a serious conversation with your artist about them avoiding areas that you tape off on your stage to indicate that there is no light there. Side note, uh, because I've been there, to those of you dealing with the more anarchic stars and, uh, and, and artists like them, I say to you, good luck and Godspeed. Of course, a poorly planned lighting or scenic design can make even a well-intentioned performer have trouble finding their light. Previous software, or even a physical model, can help tremendously in making sure your lights aren't being shaded by any errant piece of physical set or a line array or even another light. Remember that at extreme angles, you have to account for lights that might be shining through other lighting fixtures or projection equipment on the same truss. So account for that when you're planning. This last point bears repeating. When designing lighting rigs, do not forget the line arrays. Finally, in terms of layout, I wanna talk about repeatability and symmetry. A powerful aspect of visual design is repeated motifs, which we often see in disciplines like architecture and interior design, and they're often used in concert lighting design. Uh, here is a picture of a design by Roy Bennett, who designed this stage for the German band Rammstein. Note the repeated motifs of the circles of light, which form an interesting visual platform upon which to base the rest of the lighting rig. Repeating it, as he does here across the stage, allows the designer to fill in this visual space with something interesting. And Bennett here uh, is using the large silver circles as part of the visual statement. They're not just a container for additional lights. These circles help to add a focus point to the visual design as, and repeating the motif as well as its size helps to establish it as important in the overall visual canvas. Here are some other examples of repeated motifs and notice how powerful of a visual statement they can make. We don't see large matrices of beams of light in our everyday lives, and so the novelty of it can be really quite attention grabbing. Lighting pod designs have an enduring popularity because repeating lighting effects spatially looks good, and repeating a symbol or a set piece forms a point of visual interest. And another way to add visual interest is through the use of both symmetry and asymmetry. Both are good, both are correct. Within the context of concert lighting design, and both should be used within a performance to keep things from becoming too visually flat. Many designers, when they're starting to design, I did, automatically assume certain things. And one of those, sometimes, can be that symmetry should be constant. Don't get me wrong, 
Symmetry can be a powerful visual tool, particularly because it's uncommonly encountered in large scales in the real world, except in architecture. But the reverse can also be true about symmetry. Bringing all of your spots, for instance, to point stage left and all of your washes to point stage right can break the audience out of a state of dulled expectation. While set design is largely beyond the scope of this webinar, the same goes for scenic design as well as in this design from Mark Brickman. One final note on the art of creating effective lagging layouts is incorporating crowd light into your design. Personally, I think just throwing four mole phase onto your downstage truss and calling it a day is the very, very least that one can do. It can look lazy. Crowd lighting can be easy to overlook because we're often so focused on the stage, but it's important on almost all shows that you will do for a few reasons. One is that artists very much like to see the faces of their adoring fans. And two, particularly on shows that use iMag, giving the iMag operators the chance to do some audience shots will be vastly appreciated. And finally, in this age of Instagram, in almost everyone's pocket, providing concert goers with at least occasional opportunities to take some awesome pictures of themselves at their memorable event can only reflect well on the lighting designer as someone who takes social media and the individual's experience into account. So effective crowd light will try to be out of the audience's eyes, hopefully coming from the sides and behind to cut down on glare and always be a much lower intensity than the light coming from the stage. Part, not always, most of the time. Part of the psychological expectation of being at a concert is that the house will remain dark. Bright lights coming on so that the house is seen can break that expectation. So modulate your crowd intensity, crowd light intensity accordingly. So now that we have considered placement and layout as it relates to design, let's talk about the visual design and look aspect of lighting in the sense of actually pointing lights around the stage and programming a visual display. Now to help further illustrate this idea of looks, I want to bring your attention to the musical concept of leitmotif. Bring to mind, if you will, the music of Star Wars. John Williams' score for this film, series of films, is legendary. And part of what makes his work so brilliant is his use of leitmotif. These are recurring phrases of notes that are associated with a particular character or location or concept. In Star Wars, the Imperial March, I'm sure you've heard the song, is associated with Darth Vader. And the Force theme is associated with the Force and Yoda. Hearing those notes is a sound-based cue of association, and we can apply the same idea to the use of lighting. So to build on this theme, so to speak, uh, not only do we create looks in a general sense, we can create leitmotif building blocks within those looks to reference certain concepts, beats, dance moves, almost anything. Most of the time, I think what we do is we tend to use a look for each part of the song, chorus verse, solos, so on. And that's a legitimate use of the concept, but more broadly applying this concept to other elements within the performance and then importantly, bringing them back to reference them later leads to a sense of continuity and progression that can be very satisfying. So it's also important before doing any of the part of the lighting programming for a song or a section or whatever it is you're considering to take the time to understand and internalize the emotional and narrative structure and context of the piece that you're working on. Only through understanding these themes and the emotions and feelings that the artist wants and intends their song or performance to engender can we as the designers appreciate uh, what they're trying to say and approach the lighting of the performance. It is our job as the lighting designers to transliterate the emotional language and content from the music and what the artist does on stage to light. So throughout all this discussion and theorizing, remind yourself not to allow the lighting to overpower the artist. In other words, aim to be distraction free. The lighting and the artist or artists need to complement each other and work together in a symbiotic way so that the audience is transported and the message, whatever that is, gets communicated. I know I said this last time, but sometimes that message is that lighting is awesome. But more often than not, that message is something that the artist has considered thoughtfully, and the lighting needs to support that message and not overpower it. 
So let's continue our discussion with three fundamental aspects that I think are most important to lighting design as it relates to programming. And these are coherence, contrast, coverage. Now, all of these are interrelated, interdependent, and so we'll examine each one in detail. To be clear at the outset, when we discuss these fundamental concepts, we can apply them across any temporal or time period, whether that's a song, a section of a concert, the entire show, or even sections within the song itself. So in fact, utilizing a variety of time spans of all of these concepts makes for a more visually rich show, and it's definitely something you should do. Of importance here is to recognize the power of balancing novelty and similarity. Those of you who are parents know that babies are attracted to novelty, things they have never seen before. Experiments with babies and small children have shown time and time again that we as humans crave that which we have never seen before. For instance, my own youngest daughter, who is 15 months old, um, has recently taken a fascination to some really colorful plastic utensils from Ikea. We do not grow out of this tendency as we grow older. Our tastes tend to become more expensive, like fancy remote control drones and concert tickets. So for the average concert goer who attends maybe one or two shows a year, the modern rock concert provides a rich backdrop of novel experience in a visual sense. Large, technically rich lighting shows are not usually a part of everyday experience. So playing into this tendency helps to hold the audience's attention, but pulling out new tricks every other verse of a song is going to be overwhelming as well as being creatively difficult. Your lights can only do so much. So strive for balance between novelty and, for lack of a better word, sameness. Referencing ideas and concepts consistently helps to reinforce coherent themes. For instance, the moment when the astute audience member realizes that red represents the future, or whatever the case may be, whatever that concept is, that's an intellectually stimulating exercise for the viewers, but it doesn't work unless you work to set up and reinforce themes throughout the show. On the other hand, reusing the same go morph or ballet who will become trite and uninteresting. So to put it succinctly, between visual chaos and stagnation is a realm of good taste that we should all strive to be familiar with. So to begin with, let's consider the concept of coherence and examination of what makes a tasteful programming job come together. On a basic level, some visual element or group of visual elements should tie a design together, spatially, temporally, together with some aspect of the light. This could be a color, a gobo, even as something as subtle as a zoom range or a focus position. So let's look at some examples here and discuss them. Color is an obvious way that we can express coherence within a song, chunk of song, or any other period that we want to consider. Setting all of the lights to the same color across a stage provides a consistent canvas to begin to play with color. Now a deep discussion of color beyond the scope of this webinar, but Martin generously allowed me to do a webinar on color theory for concerts prior to this one. So if that topic interests you, you should check it out. Coherence can also be expressed other ways, say through movement. We could, for instance, have a specific sweep that we do across the stage or through the audience to indicate the emotion of happiness or a specific time period being expressed in a song or a physical place or the more general concept of, say, conflict. By building specific visual light motifs and repeating them across time, we reinforce the theme. This last bit is the key to making the concept work, repetition across time. Repetition equals importance. Repeating visual motifs or cues across time is how the audience comes to associate the visual cue with the lyrical or the musical cue. Expressing coherence through uniformity of angle, of lighting, of color temperature, of color, of movement, even chaotic movement, is a powerful tool for the expression of meaning and emotion. While it might seem obvious, a reminder here about the backdrop of all this poetry and light the music. People usually come to concerts knowing at least some of the songs, or even most of the songs, so allow the audience's knowledge of and love for the music to factor into the calculations you make with regard to the balancing act of coherent programming. 
And that brings us to our second fundamental concept to consider, and that is contrast. Often we speak about contrast in terms of color, but we can apply the concept more broadly than to just hue. Think of contrast in terms of using the lighting instruments to differentiate not only color and brightness, but also in terms of opposing pairs of qualities. Saturated color and pastels or whites, movement and stillness, texture and flat washes, gobos, smooth shafts of light, narrow beams and fat beams, hard focus and soft pools of ethereal light. And this is not to say that every scene needs to be a study in opposites. That's not true at all. But what every performance should have is a study of contrasts over some period of time. Is one part of the song bright? What is that brightness contrasted against? Perhaps the first half of the concert is devoid of gobos and pattern, and we, the next section we texture every available surface. Again, an important precept is that we approach and consider lighting design in two ways, in both a granular sense on a case-by-case -case basis within songs or bits of performance, but also as chunks of the performance that reach around and beyond individual songs and encompass sections, however big you want to make those. So further, we have to reach our consideration beyond those chunks and consider the performance as a whole, as something greater than the sum of its parts. Some other practical areas that we can apply contrast to are, for example, brightness. Contrast in brightness can make a statement, either in its liberal application or its relative lack of being in a particular scene. Maybe for part of the song, you want to apply a very flat six o'clock news look to the stage or performer, and another part of the performance calls for deep shadows. So contrast in, for example, pattern can be very exciting. Mix different gobos, morph them back and forth to create alternating patterns, putting gobos with a strong linear component adjacent to gobos with strong circles or breakups. That can make a really strong visual statement. Contrast in a more concrete sense of the qualities of lights that our fixtures output is important as well. Different optical systems and lenses create different looks of light. And nowhere is this more evident than the differences between a proper wash light and a hard edge light. This difference cannot be overstated and it remains a fundamental of making lighting designs look balanced. A proper Fresnel wash light has a softness about it that makes it look very different from the light cast by a hard edge spot. It also looks much different and better, in my opinion, than uh, a hybrid fixture with a heavy, heavy frost optic across the output. The contrast between soft and hard beams, a sharp cutoff versus a gradual fade off is one of the most powerful tools a lighting designer has because other than gobos and shutters, it's one of the few ways that we can alter the shape of the light. There is a vast difference in mood between a person lit with a dramatic shaft of textured hard edge light and a person lit with a dramatic shaft of focused but soft Fresnel light. Plano convex lenses provide additional ways to shape the light to our liking. The PC lens option on the VL3500 wash, for instance, is a great example of this. It's not a wide wash, but it's also not a spot. It's something in between, and it has a different look to it altogether than either of those. So to remind you, we as lighting designers deal in looks and the ways in which we alter the light to suit our needs is the currency of visual design. And this brings us to coverage, the final piece of the puzzle in our three fundamental concepts. Coverage I define as being able to light all of the areas of the stage, but beyond that, being able to light our areas with each type of light and different purposes of light so that we can effectively create the mood we want in places on the stage we want it to be. We already briefly discussed coverage when discussing layouts, and we return to it here to discuss types of coverage. And these four types I conceive as directional or spot lighting. And this is when we point a light at something to light it specifically, irrespective of how anything else on the stage is lit. So examples include a dramatic shaft of light shining onto a performer, a row of narrow pars focused at a car, etc. And the next is wash lighting. Wash lighting or area lighting, I think, will be intuitively understood by most people. It's lighting meant to cover a large area. 
rows of washes zoomed up to cover a stage is an obvious example, but part of edge fixtures painting a go-go -go pattern over a large portion of the set, uh, in this instance, can also be thought of as wash lighting. And then there's beams. Beams of light shining through haze or fog, which might or might not be focused at any one thing in particular, but the primary purpose of which is to create dramatic shafts of light in the air, not necessarily to light an object. And finally, accent lighting. Lights that are generally on the smaller side, which are meant to highlight little bits of scenery or people in a small, controlled way. And lots of times, lighting, uh, accent lighting remains hidden from view, and its purpose is to reveal the form of scenery or small bits of set. So let's take each one of these in turn, keeping in mind at the outset that lighting can serve more than one purpose. A bank of spotlights can wash an area as well. Uh, so these purposes are not really at odds with each other. Rather, I think it's helpful to conceive of these in terms of percentages. For instance, the purpose of that bank of spots shining down is 75% of the time it's spots and 25% of the time it's wash. This sort of thinking will help to highlight the interdependent nature of lighting purposes. So to dive deeper, let's start with directional or spot lighting. We understand intuitively as humans that pointing a light at something indicates its importance on stage. As we said earlier, our eyes are drawn to the portion of the stage that is lit the brightest. Intensity of illumination is a proxy for relevance on a stage. Pointing lights at specific places is like a giant finger pointing at them that says, look at this! And it's a powerful tool to direct attention to places you want to, and conversely, using its absence to get people to ignore places you don't want them to look during set changes or the like. So combining this with the idea of contrast, you can begin to see how a scene in which we layer different intensities works. The most important parts of the scene are the brightest, but layering different intensities gives us contrast to provide visual interest and illuminate the rest of the performance. So moving on, let's discuss wash lighting. With wash lighting, we can paint large sections of the stage with splashes of color, which is the name would imply is one of the primary purposes of wash lights. Units with a Fresnel optic can create a dreamy, hazy look by creating soft edge shadows. However, we can wash large sections of the stage, as we said, with hard edge fixtures as well, which gives a totally different look than by using wash fixtures with a Fresnel or stippled optical characteristics. You can accomplish a stage wash with zoomed out gobos. You can apply a textured wash to large areas. Wash lighting is also a good way to play with contrast. As the concept implies, applying lighting across large areas of scenery and performances. Stages often have a lot of contrast across their visual fields and using a lot of wash lighting can help reduce the contrast as an effect, blanketing the area, sort of making everything smooth and even. And our third type of coverage is beams, which in which we use the lighting not to light a specific uh, something or someone on the stage, but rather we use light simply for its own sake and intentionally light the haze in the air to create dramatic sculptural forms of light. There's a real art to doing this because by mixing and matching the types of lighting and the effects, uh, gobos, irises, and shutter cuts that you're using, you can get a variety of interesting effects. It is important not to overlight with beams because things can quickly get messy and overlit. Turning lights off can make as powerful a statement as turning them on. The lessons of minimalism can really be applicable here. And finally, we come to accent lighting as a form of coverage. Accent lighting can act as the real secret sauce of a lighting design, pulling in disparate elements by allowing you to use the lighting to bring them together. Generally, we use accent lighting on set pieces, but you can also use it on people in the right context. Accent lighting is, as we said, generally hidden from view, but by lighting set pieces with it, you can add dimensionality to your programming. As the fixtures chosen for accent lighting are generally small, they're usually less expensive or easier to implement in large numbers around your stage than, say, a larger moving head fixture. So think of accent lighting as a way to play with dimensionality. It gives clues about the visual depth to the audience, giving them a greater sense of the depth of the stage 
and how far away individual elements are away from them. And I can help erase some of the flatness caused by viewing everything head on. It also allows you to color entire regions of sets, which adds dynamism and visual interest to your designs. So to bring this section to a conclusion, remember that nearly every look, nearly every visual that you find yourself putting together on a stage is going to have all of these in some combination. And in fact, nearly every effective visual design or scene is going to have more than one of these in some combination. You will usually need at least some wash to help define the space, some accent lighting to help bring dimensionality to our scenic designs. Sometimes we have a lot of beams, though it might be visually interesting to turn off all of the washes for a moment. Visually effective moments could have just a, a striking scenic design illuminated only by accent lighting. This is also a good place to talk about letting your programming breathe and not get too carried away with having every light on all the time, by way of contrast. In fact, depending on the number of lights you have available, it is a good idea to keep at least some of them off for each song to force yourself to use things creatively and not get into the bad habit of having every light on all the time. Far from wasting the potential of a rig, this actually enhances its utility by forcing you to be more creative with it um, and not allowing the audience to get too used to any one look of a light fixture or beam type. Keeping some lights off when you really want to turn them on can help force you into new ways of seeing things. And finally, let's talk about the special case of lighting your talent. An effective lighting design will usually, there are some exceptions, be based around the idea that what most people are interested in seeing is their favorite performer, as well as they can possibly see them. So with this in mind, it becomes clear that perhaps the most important light can be the money light, the light on a performer's face and body. Do not skimp on lighting your talent, because while you may have programmed the most beautiful lighting design to end all of others, it doesn't matter one whit if your talent can't be seen by the people, or indeed, by the many, many cameras, both yours and other people's, that will be capturing them. At a minimum, for good photography light, this is in a general sense. Again, there are exceptions for effects. Aim for two sources of light from either side at between 45 to 60 degrees off center and some good backlight to help pull them out of the background, some shoulder and hair light. These ingredients are critical in making sure that your talent stands out from the rest of the stage. That said, there are artistic or other reasons you might not want to do that all the time. Perhaps you want a silhouette look or a particularly flat, low contrast look because it fits the theme of the song or the section of the concert. These are valid, but be aware that those artistic desires must always be balanced with the desire of the audience to get as close as they can visually and have a psychological connection, uh, a feeling of connection with their artist. As for instruments, I am personally a huge fan of automated follow spots for lighting, by which I mean taking a conventional intelligent fixture and either disconnecting its pan and tilt and adding a handle and DMX control, or uh, a more advanced option like the, the PRG ground control system or the Roby Robo Spot. These systems allow the LD perfectly synchronized manual control over the brightness levels, colors, iris, uh, or any other attribute the light has. And in the hands of an attentive operator, they can be about the least visually intrusive option that there is. I say intrusive because, again, personally, I don't care for follow spots in a visual sense because they are a distraction. And they break up the looks that you have going on stage. To that end, I prefer more follow spots run at lower intensity to cover artists rather than having just one or two big beefy boys shining in all of their glory clear across an arena. Running at lower intensities can mean that your light interacts less with the haze and that can help clean up a look. But really, until Roscoe invents a gel that makes the beam of light invisible to haze, we're going to have to live with the problem of lighting talent with follow spots. I'm also a fan of automated backlight follow spots. You can create some really, truly lovely looks using that technique. And of course, if your budget allows for something like black tracks and a team of engineers to implement it, I both salute and envy you. A last word about artist light is not to be afraid to get artistic with it. Strong side light from one or both sides, backlight only. If it works, 
bathe the entire stage in seafoam green, but program in moments throughout the show to give your artist a real blanket of beauty light, a nice balance of warm, cool from different directions, as good an approximation as a photography studio as you can, because that's the photograph that's going to headline any article or social media post that gets attention. So to bring it all home, we as lighting designers deal just one currency, and that is looks. Our looks define the flow of the show. The narrative it defines how smoothly we slide from one song to the next. Looks are the thing we create that have value to the artists that we work for and the audience that spends their hard-earned money to come see the show. And with that, come to the end of my presentation. I hope that despite this perhaps being a bit more on the abstract side, you learned something or heard a concept that challenged or helped you. I want to again thank Martin Professional and Harmon for inviting me to come give this talk to all of you. And again, thank all of you for taking time out of your day to schedule uh, and to spend a few moments chatting with me about this thing that we love to do. And finally, I want to thank Laura uh, and Mallory for being our masters of ceremony, so to speak. Uh, and with that, we will open it up to questions from the audience. Thank you, Craig. Um, before we jump into the questions, I just wanted to um, call off the names that were randomly selected. And I'm going to apologize in advance if you hear any baby crying in the background. <laughs> um, so Alex Hughes, Brandon Randall, Lynn Joslin, Scott Pizzo, and Tom Gorman. Um, I'm going to drop my email address into the chat window in a minute here. So if you just want to follow up with me and I'll get your mailing address from you and we'll get you some really cool Martin Swag sent out. So thank you all for attending the 100th learning session. Um, we're going to jump into some questions here. So we have a question about um, what is your point of view with LDs who are only operators and are constantly repeating the same looks on all of their events? What is the key to innovate in the industry as an LD? Um, so there are a couple different ways and I've, I've been in this situation before where I was just sort of hired to come out and run the show. Uh, one of the ways that you can uh, help to advance uh, your, your, your thoughts, your feelings, your desires is to do offline programming on the rig um, when, when no one's around, when, when the rig is yours to play with. Um, pull out the, the time code track and, and pop it into the desk and do your own design. Um, maybe someone will see it, maybe not. It can be a way. Um, I've done it before during downtime, just, just programming for fun. Another is um, a lot of times artists will want to add songs to their, to their shows that they had not, uh, that they hadn't done uh, at tour rehearsals or at the very beginning. And that can offer an opportunity um, if you do it in the right way, uh, to be offered the uh, opportunity to program, uh, program a song. Um, that happened with me a couple of times. Um, the, the artist didn't want to bring the, the designer back and said, uh, please program up these songs. And I talked to the designer and they were fine with that. And so I went ahead and, and did the program. Sometimes you just have to do the programming and it doesn't matter uh, because they just decide one day they're going to add this song, and you have to come up with a, a decent look for it. Um, that's also happened to me. There was just, I got told that morning, by the way, uh, she's going to play this song, so you're going to need some looks for that. Uh, sometimes they don't even tell you. You find out during sound check. That can also be really exciting. All right, next question is asking if there's any tips for creative looks or designs with very limited rigging fixture placement flexibility. So... Um, I think maybe the question is, is how do you do effective designs when you don't have the ability to put them in the air? Um, is that important with your understanding? I hope so. I hope that's what the question is because that's kind of how I'm going to answer it. Obviously, uh, vertical trusses are a perennial favorite of many a designer. Um, and you just have to find ways, I think, to get creative with how you're going to light things from low angles. There's a lot that you can do with low angles. Um, it's not all about rigging. And, you know, you can, you can set the expectation early 
uh, in the show by doing something really creative, having cool sweeps, uh, any of the programming tricks that you know and have uh, in, your, in your tool bag um, can be effective in really bringing a ground-supported rig to life. Um, I agree that that could be a, a challenging, a challenging uh, thing to work within, but I think any height that you can give, like I said, with vertical trusses or you can use U trusses that are ground-supported, um, getting things off the ground uh, to the maximum height that you can will help bring some verticality and uh, uh, additional visual flair to your designs. All right, next question is asking, what is the importance of using white light when a performer is on stage? Uh, well, as I said in the, in the presentation, it's, it's important in that, one, it's generally the way that we see people every day. It's a familiar way of looking at people almost always see them in white light unless there's a very odd situation happening. Um, it's also the light that cameras want to use. Uh, typically, they're, they're balanced for some, some form of white light, and they, they do their best work when they, are, when they are given that to work with. And I think there's a lot of importance in using at least some white light. Again, not all of the time. You know, there's, uh, there's designs that I've seen recently where a lot of the time the artists are shrouded in darkness, and that's the way she wanted to be, and that can really work. Um, and you can, you can light. This artist was also lit with some really saturated colors, and that can really work. I think it's important to have a few times throughout the night where you have a decent light that people can take pictures with, because that's how I think we as artists sort of uh, promote our work. And there's not too many people who are just going to want to look at pictures of really cool lighting rigs outside of our industry when something gets posted to, um, to, uh, to articles about your work, um, they almost always want to have a, a picture of the performer so that people know who it is you're talking about. And so that's why I think white light is important to, uh, to use uh, in a minimal sense, at least, uh, on, your, on your shows, on your artists. Um, like I said, not all the time, but uh, program in a few. Okay, next question. How do you work with video content in your design? If the screens have blue content, do you always go blue? Do you have to complement the content at all? Uh, absolutely. I think content, reading the content and how to design lights around it is, is hugely important in terms of skill of design because uh, a lot of times you will get content from a design house that's just sent to you on a hard drive and you have to use it and that that informs your color choices i think that uh to the question of do you always have to match the colors absolutely not no i think that that would get visually boring um match them sometimes but not all the time and what i like to do is to have moments where i use a complementary color or a tertiary a, a triad to the dominant color that the video is doing um, and that can really help to excuse me, uh, give you a great color palette on stage that isn't just the one thing. Of course, sometimes matching it is really effective. Uh, Baz Halpin designed uh, the Taylor Swift tour, and the lighting, uh, at the very first song, uh, there was a lot of black and white and red, and he did the same thing with the lights, and it worked brilliantly. It's one of the best opening sequences is on the Reputation Tour, one of the best opening songs I've ever seen. He's Baz is a wonderful designer. Um, but he matched his colors to the, to the content of that song, and I thought that really worked. Other times, he contrasted them, and I think that's the way to go. Sometimes you do a contrasting, complementary, triad color, and other times you match them as closely as possible. It's really what I think the, um, the song calls for. But again, a lot of times you're just given the content, and and you have to work with it, and there's not a lot of back and forth between the content creator and yourself. Or it was done weeks ahead of time, and now they've moved on something else. They don't have time to adjust the color if you want them to. So. The next comment, um, I love your in-depth analysis of this topic. How can I hear your feelings on other lighting topics? Do you have a podcast or something? <laughs> I'm not sure who asked that question. Uh, I know Alex is, is here, and hi, Alex. Uh, but yes, uh, this isn't really a platform 
uh, for me to uh, plug my, my podcast, but I do. It's called Lighting Nerds. You can listen at lightingnerds.com or wherever you get your podcasts. Um, I have recently moved, so a new uh, podcast is a little late in coming. My house has been a real bag of nightmares since I moved in, so I'm a little bit behind, but we've got a really fun one coming out. And I encourage you to uh, go listen to that. It's called The Lighting Nerds. Next question. Have you ever struggled with a proper lighting design as a result of artwork on LED screens? Uh, yes. <laughs> yes, I have. Um, we ha I had one artist uh, that had, we'll call him a very old school artist. Uh, he, was, he had been sort of gotten his really big start in the 90s and all the way through, and I came in much later than that. And <clears throat> the way that his content worked was it was all music videos. It was all his music videos that he had done throughout the, the, the early 90s and beyond. And that's the content that he wanted to use in every single show. Um, fun fact, no click track. I had to listen to the drummer counting off, uh, counting off with his sticks at the beginning of every song to get the, the timing right because the artist wanted the music video to lip sync with him on the stage. That was a fun show. Uh, it was really, actually, it was a very fun show. A lot of friends from that one. But that made it difficult creatively to do new looks um, because a lot of the colors were there. They were there in the video, and I knew what they were going to be each consecutive year. Videos did not change. One of the ways that I uh, not got around it, but one of the ways that I worked with that was to really try to incorporate iMag into into that scenario and we had a capture card in the media server and so to try to get away from maybe some of the more uh, disharmonious color combinations that would show up on the screen, I would fade to iMag and then sort of just do what felt right um, with the song there. But it's absolutely possible to struggle uh, with creating a, a lighting design that works with, with the content. Um, I don't have and I'm sure that I have a, a, a really good uh, process to follow that will work in all scenarios. I think it's just a matter of trying your best to, to see what works and deciding what's best. So the next question is asking if the parkans are already part of lighting history. Um, are they not really in use in concerts anymore? Uh, park hands, that's, a, that's an interesting question. Uh, park hands are absolutely still in use. I still see them on shows. Uh, small clubs and bars will often have some, some cars or some ACLs that you can use. Theaters have a lot of them, uh, typically, if you go into a, a theater. Less and less these days, but you're still going to find them around. Um, and they're still, they're still useful. The that beautiful incandescent glow that we as designers love so much and that is so uh, so popular on sort of more acoustic or uh, um, I don't know what to say here. Let's say acoustic. Acoustic sounding, sounding shows. That's a word. Sounding. Um, they still get used and they still, have a, they still have a great look. I think there are a lot of products that are so good at approximating uh, an incandescent look that they're not necessary anymore and they're probably easier to implement from a power and data distribution standpoint, but absolutely you will still find them. So the next question is asking, do you usually put the one light to one dimming channel even, there is the, even if there is the possibility to add two lights to the same channel? <laughs> I'm, I'm sure you can hear that in the background. I am uh, <laughs> watching my granddaughter because my uh, daughter's normal sitter is on holiday. So I apologize for the spitting that you're hearing. <laughs> um, but the question's asking if you put one light to one dimming channel, even if there's the possibility to add two lights to the channel, if the dimmer in the example is one is 5K and one light is 2K, or do you like to add all lights to one single dimming channel? I think that this is a question specifically about dimmers and conventional lights, and I can't say that I have ever used a 2K conventional light on any show that I've ever done. Um, I would say I typically keep it to one, one light, one dimmer, um, although there have been times where to ease patching, I have done multi-patches. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
um, so that when I have, say, a, a four or an eight bank of lights and I want them to come on at one time, I will do a multi-patch so that they, they never slip back and forth. Um, I've done that before. Um, but I don't have much occasion these days to do shows where I'm using real conventional fixtures. They're mostly LED or arc uh, these days. Okay, we have another person asking if you can um, say again, what was the name of your podcast? Was it lightingearth.com? It is lighty, uh, lightingnerds.com. Nerds, nerds. Perfect. Okay, it looks like we have a few more questions. Um, how much influence does your artist have on your design choice for angles, symmetry, color, and other concepts? Um, it depends on the artist, and it always depends on the artist. I've had artists where I walked in, uh, as the artist I was referring to earlier, they said, here is the media that we want to use, and go sit in your, in your, uh, your programming suite for a while and, and give us something. And then I never heard any feedback whatsoever about the lighting other than occasionally the follow spots were at too low of an angle and you didn't like uh, having them in his eyes. Um, and then there are artists who are a little bit more uh, persnickety about, about things like that. Usually with artists, it's in relation to um, them being able to see or them having a problem with things like strobe effects. A lot of artists don't care for strobe effects um, going off in their face or they, uh, they don't like, say, looking down and having a light you know, shining straight about them. I had an artist who, despite the a big hat that he wore, would absolutely not let me light him from below. And so I just had to kind of deal with that. I really wanted to put some like low grade sort of foot lighting to sort of fill in his face. He wouldn't have any of it. So it just kind of depends on, on the artist. Um, most of them, when you're coming up with your layouts, they don't care about the layout uh, so much as they do the overall looks that you can show them when you're pitching your design ideas to them. Uh, so I would say that's more what they care about. What's the feeling that you're, that you're bringing to them? And if they like the feeling, if they like, they like the, the overall visual effects, uh, whether or not you put a Sharpie or a Viper there is not really something I think that's on most of their radars. When designing, do you prefer symmetry or asymmetry? Symmetry. I start with symmetry. Um, there, there are really effective asymmetrical designs. Mark Allen, Mark, Mark Allen, wow. Uh, Mark Brickman uh, did one that we looked at earlier for uh, Toby, Toby, my goodness, I can't talk. For Keith Urban's, my goodness, Keith Urban's Get Closer to Her in 2011. He did this wonderful loop de ribbon uh, it was. It had this big screen off the one side. It had ribbons with automated sharpies on them. Really cool design. Very asymmetrical, and it worked really well because he's Mark Brickman and he can make anything work. Um, I typically start from a place of symmetry because I think once you go asymmetrical, you can't really go back. So if the art, if that's something that really speaks to the artist, you can go with it. But you can do asymmetrical looks with a symmetrical set. And so I think that that gives me a little bit more flexibility. Um, that said, there are designers out there doing really awesome asymmetrical sets. And uh, it's kind of just what depends, depends on what works for you, I think, as a designer and, and what speaks to you and your artist, ultimately. What would you recommend to avoid at all costs during the design process? Something like red and green should never be seen would be a nice tip. Oh man, I think I talked about red and green in the, in the color webinar. I don't know, I think red and green equals Christmas, but in the right context, maybe it could work. Uh, something to avoid at all costs. Um, I don't know that there is a thing to avoid at all costs. Avoid rigging mistakes at all costs. Avoid making your artist angry at all costs. But I think um, really in the right context, fluorescent green can work on a ballad. It just kind of depends on the song, depends on what the artist wants and the emotional content that they are going for. So I think if you're supporting the music in a way that makes sense to the artist and to the audience, um, 
there's not many rules after that. How do you balance lighting the artist from the front without blinding them? <laughs> uh, you keep the you keep the lights at angles. Uh, that's that's probably number one. Um, there are some. There are many. Some. There are many arenas that have the most dreadful follow spot positions that you can possibly imagine. There are. You go to an arena and and up in the very back they've got a follow spot dead center to the stage and it's a low arena. Awful. Absolutely awful. It looks flat and it blinds it blinds your your artist and they typically don't like that. Um, I try to get lights for, for key light on my artists off to the side. If there's a side option, I will use it every time. Um, other than that, I think having more lights, like I said, run at lower intensities can help too. And that way you get, you get the intensity that you want on your artist without all of that intensity necessarily coming from one direction or one place that they're going to look at all the time. Uh, Sometimes it's unavoidable and you have to have a talk with your artist that day and say, look, there's no other place to lighten from. You're not going to be able to see the audience as much as you want. I'm really sorry about that. And hopefully it's better the next day. Um, but not every arena, not every venue is perfect. Um, but as much as possible, try to get those lights off to the side because most people will spend their time looking forward off to the side, run the middle lower intensity if you can and have more of them if that's not enough. Looks like that was the last question. So thank you so much, Craig. And just a heads up to everybody, Craig does have another session next week. If you'd like to join us again, he'll be presenting with Brad Schiller from Harmon, um, from Martin. And um, they're gonna be doing a session on the history and evolution of automated lighting. So you can go out to pro.harmon.com and find that on the calendar and get registered for that one. So thank you, Craig, for presenting and thank you everyone for joining us on today's 100th learning session. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you so much.